Okay, Patrick, you want to walk us through a couple of case studies here and Sinu and I'll uh, jump in and chime in on our management. Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I think we need to get to some of the, you know, the, the why is great and the experience that you guys have shared and really talking about being a little bit more targeted and, and being a little more precise with smaller volumes and being purposeful about how we approach it within a common framework is good, but um, let's perhaps go through some examples of how you guys do that at, at your institution. So uh, our first case is uh, a patient who is uh, undergoing a three vessel off pump uh, bypass. She's got underlying good cardiac function with an EF of 55%, uh, and she's received a couple hundred milliliters of cell saver and about a liter of fluid. Uh, and we're gonna pick up with her as she's arriving uh, in that transition into the ICU bed. So as we attach her to the bedside monitor uh, and we get all of our monitor up and running, our baseline assessment uh, of basic monitoring information is, is up on the screen. So what are your initial thoughts, Dan, on how you would uh, receive this patient and what would be important to you as we move the patient along? Yeah, great, great question. So, you know, the, you know, I've, obviously they're a touch tachycardic and their blood pressure is a little bit on the low side. Their CVP is 10. You know, we, so we know that CVP is kind of a one single number that it doesn't always correlate with exactly everything that we want. So, you know, as I'm looking at this patient, I'm obviously that blood pressure is coming to mind. Okay, is this where we want to be? Is our perfusion adequate? Are our kidneys being perfused? But really the first thing I'm going to be asking you for and asking, you know, our, my anesthesia handoff here is, okay, I need a little bit more, you know, where have we been? What, what did our EF look like coming off pump, um, you know, with our TEE, you know, what, what kind of numbers were you seeing back there? Is this a change? So I really want to know one point in time is great, but really that handoff period is critical. You know, are you responding to the fluid as we're, as we're loading, you know, the ventricle here with additional fluids? Is, is the patient coming up nicely or not? So really just, you know, I've got my baseline data, but I need some more, give me more. All right, so I'll give you a little bit more in the form of let's hook up our advanced monitoring and give you some of the underlying hemodynamics for that physiology piece. Uh, so once we get the patient hooked up and, and we have a little data and you peek your head back into the room, this is what we're seeing. Yeah, great. So, you know, what, you know, I think the things that should begin to jump out at us here is, you know, we're, we're beginning to see, uh, you know, a stroke volume that, you know, depending on the patient, you know, it isn't exactly where I want it. I would like to see that be, uh, you know, a little bit higher, you know, but I, and I'm seeing a stroke volume variation if we're using that, you know, at this point, the patient's still pretty deep, that that's, you know, certainly indicative of that this patient may be uh, on the dry side and might respond to a fluid challenge. Our SVR is reasonable. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, uh, not terribly high, not terribly low at this point um, in our, you know, our cardiac output is, is only four liters a minute, meaning depending on the size of the patient that indexed uh, down is, is, is probably not where we want it yet. So, you know, I think this is a patient we would probably want to, you know, consider giving that first fluid bolus in and just see how our numbers change over time. All right, so we'll go ahead and take care of that and get that first uh, bolus and we'll use the, uh, the protocols that you guys have in place. So if you want to follow along with those, Give a small aliquot in this uh, instance, we decided to give 250. And then on the monitor, you see both of where we were before we gave the fluid in the form of this intervention. And then you see on the, the right-hand side, as we're giving that fluid, or that, that aliquot of fluid relatively quickly to judge that response, you can see the percentage change here in stroke volume and the other parameters. Yeah. It, post volume variation too, yeah. Yeah, and, and that, that's that's really nice. So you look at the, you know, kind of the stroke volume variation. You So you come from this really high variability state. And as we load the ventral, ventricle, that variability begins to come down, right? So we see that kind of on the second graph there where it moves from the yellow or the red to the yellow there. It, you know, it's coming down into a more normal range. And you also see the stroke volume itself come up. Again, you know, going back to that kind of early physiology preload here, when we load the heart optimally, if the heart can squeeze, it's going to squeeze and it, it's going to like that additional fluid. And, you know, our cardiac output came up, our SVR went down, everything is moving in the right direction. Blood pressure is still on the low side, but even before our blood pressure is budged, and I think this is an important point, even before we see that map really begin to move up in earnest, we've begun to see these other, you know, parameters shift early. And that's important because I don't have to wait on the map to go to 75 for me to know it's worked. Okay. I now have a, it, you know, a framework in mind where I can say, okay, this patient is fluid responsive. I know what they need. Okay. So we can give them a little more fluid. All right. So we'll go ahead and give another challenge. We'll skip ahead a little bit here. And then you see with the second challenge, again, we continue to have a volume responsive patient. That stroke volume went up 13% in this instance. And you see the other changes. 
And also notice like uh, one of the things that used to be old kind of teaching and people would look, put a lot of weight on CVP. But notice in this patient, the CVP really hasn't budged. Yep. Yep. And, and, it's, and it's, it's also, you know, it's kind of a, the CVP is a blunt instrument. It's the really, uh, you know, I think in, you know, this, this era, we've got much finer tools and that's what this is showing us. You know, we can, we can give smaller amounts of fluid because with smaller amounts of fluid, we can still tell the answer. And, and that's really what, you know, we're able to get with these advanced uh, monitoring tools. Absolutely. So, so with this patient, are you satisfied with the resuscitation or knowing that, you know, they're in for a longer course and you might have a little more room to improve? Would you give another uh, fluid challenge? At this one, I probably would. I mean, you know, it, it obviously is going to depend a little bit on, you know, all the other things, you know, what was their, you know, where exactly is their EF, you know, kind of where's their level of sedation, all these other things that we don't have right in front of us that we, you know, if we were at the bedside together, we could really make the decision. But in general, I, I would, in this patient, I would probably err on a little bit more. Yeah, they've been responsive twice with 250. And that's the beauty of the smaller aliquot, right? We can be a little more precise. So yep. um, so when we give that additional fluid challenge and we look at our data here, it looks like we've got about an 8% change in our stroke volume. So walk us through your thought process here. Yeah, so when, when you see your fluid bolus no longer begin to work, okay? And, we, you know, if, if we do this enough, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to reach that point where, okay, okay, it worked, it worked, okay, it didn't work. Um, what happened? Well, something about the patient may have changed. And, you know, this is where I think we have to be kind of, uh, we need to be nimble in our decision making and kind of light on our feet here. So as I look at this, you know, we gave the fluid, the, the stroke volume didn't really change. Okay, so it's not a fluid problem. Where's my other you know, perturbation? Where's the other problem here? Well, my cardiac output is actually reasonable, you know, still above five liters a minute. So if I've got reasonable fill, you know, the, the, the tank is reasonably full and I've got reasonable cardiac output, why is my blood pressure low? Well, it's a resistance problem. I don't have the vascular tone that I need. And I can see on here that my SVR has slowly downtrended. If you remember on the other slides, it was about 1,100, 1,000. Now we're down under 900. So I think I've got a peripheral, you know, vasoconstrictive problem, okay? All right, and so if we treat that, and we give a vasopressor, small dose, or a continuous infusion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where we ended up with the patient. So uh, thoughts on where the patient is now after 750 cc's of fluid after landing to the ICU and a small dose of a vasopressor infusion. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, ha I'm happier now. Uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, certainly he's going to, we're going to have a work in prog, you know, progress throughout the night uh, as we continue to resuscitate and monitor the patient. But we're now, we've now got a, you know, an adequate blood pressure. You know, we are on, you know, a reasonable, you know, uh, vasopressor here to kind of help support us. And we're no longer, we're not fluid responsive at this moment. Not to say we won't be later, but for now, I think we're looking okay. Sino, are you, Sino, are you pleased? Yeah, I think so. Your stroke volume variation has come down to under 10%. So you know that really more fluid is not going to do that much more for the patient. Your nice perfusion pressure of 72, which is good for the kidney that we talked about earlier. And you've got a situation where your SVR has come up and uh, probably a little more optimization there by tightening them up. But I think you're in a good place. Would you say in your practice, as we get into our second case, is this more typical as you get a little more refined of, as you're a little more methodical, a little more precise, you tend not to have big swings and a lot of surprises? Um, in this post-op course as you guys are all dealing with it in the same framework or does it create um, kind of more chaos and more variability when you approach it like this? Oh no, absolutely. This really cleans up the thing just like uh, Dan alluded to. I think uh, nurses feel empowered. They've got a tool, they've got a visual tool, they've got an analytical tool, uh, and then they've got interventions already mapped out. Of course, if they start deviating from that pathway or people start falling off the curve, then they have an appropriateness to call and they can also say, hey, this is where I was. This is where I, what I've uh, intervened with and what do you want to, uh, me to do next? And I'm sure for Dan and from an administrative standpoint, it's better too because it reduces the number of unnecessary phone calls uh, and really makes his care that he can provide much more efficient. Yeah, it, that, that's perfect. And you're getting called with, hey, I've done these things already and I'm still having problems rather than just here's some information, make a decision. It's, it, it allows us to be, you know, more data-driven as we respond. So uh, I agree, it makes life better for us, which is always a plus. All right, well, let's move on to our, our next patient. So our second patient here uh, is undergoing a three-vessel on-pump uh, surgery. Uh, he has a 40% underlying ejection fraction on his pre-op workup. 
Uh, and then we're going to pick this patient up as he starts to come off bypass. So a little bit different. We're going to peek into the OR and, and get perhaps senior thoughts on uh, as we're starting to come off pump, or is there anything in particular that is worrisome or problematic or that you guys tend to give a little more attention to as we wean off the pump and, and finish the surgery and then move to closing the chest? Senior? It's the, the main thing is, you know, how's the pump run been, short, long, and then what, how much uh, how many drugs are you coming off on? You know, I was taught a long time ago, kind of an algorithm. It's kind of wires, wires, uh, and then, uh, you know, you got to make sure that your atrial wires are on, your ventricular wires are on, and that the patient is warm. And then it's all about the Vs. The V is volume, of vasopressors, and that you're ventilating. If you, if you do those things, then that's kind of where you want to be coming off bypass. All those things, uh, checkbox, a good rhythm, which you have adequate rhythm here, could be a little faster. Uh, you've got a low stroke volume variation telling you that you're pretty tanked up. A little bit on the lower blood pressure side, but not in a bad place and reasonable uh, vascular resistance. All right, so obviously that transition can happen rather quickly and we're gonna find ourselves in the ICU here shortly. Uh, and then that handoff you talked about uh, is really important to talk about those other assessment findings in that course. Um, so Dan, do you wanna pick the patient up uh, here in the ICU and walk us through, again, your algorithm and your thought process of, of transitioning uh, into yeah, absolutely. post-op? Absolutely. So, you know, th this is an interesting patient, you know, for a lot of reasons. And I think the first the first is, you know, as you the first thing I'll, I'll kind of editor editorialize as we come off pump, that is a really huge physiologic, you know, shift. And, you know, our good, you know, cardiac surgeons and cardiac anesthesiologists are really uh, paying a lot of attention to how that heart changes as you close up that chest. And, you know, TEE is is probably irreplaceable, I think, for us at this point, you know, is, is largely is being widely used. Um, but, you know, Correlating that to these first set of numbers is really important too, and I think can really help us as we kind of come into the you know come into the ICU setting. So what we see here, and I think it's also notice it's important to note the history. Our EF is down in this patient, unlike our last patient who had a preserved EF. Our, we know that our patient's EF is, is down, um, so that's going to impact really how we approach this and how we think about this patient. So I have to tuck that away in the back of your mind here. So, you know, very early on, you know, we see a cardiac output that is depressed. Um, uh, you know, certainly, you know, this is a, you know, full grown male 3.7 is gonna be pretty doggone low. Um, you know, we see that stroke volume variation looking a little bit high. We see a stroke volume that, you know, uh, is reasonable, but really depends on the heart size. And then we see an SVR that's probably on the high side here. So we kind of clamp down, um, you know, heart that's not squeezing great. Yes, you know, so we've got a few things that we need to sort out pretty quickly, um, you know, as we work with this. We've also got a fairly narrow pulse pressure, again, which kind of, um, uh, you know, should be tipping us off to a few things potentially. So I think, again, you know, common things being common, we're going to start with a little bit of fluid bolus here, give them some fluid, see if we can uh, perk things up. All right. So in this example, our, our institution is doing 500 boluses. So after our first bolus, you guys see your, your numbers here. So uh, yeah. Guys. So, so again, you know, as we as we jump right in, we see a, a pretty nice, uh, you know, increase in, in our both our stroke volume, um, you know, decrease in our variability there, you know, pretty large decrease actually in the stroke volume variation as we give this fluid and our and our output came up, right? Output comes up, uh, SVR goes down, everything, you know, the body is more perfused, so that resistance can relax. Okay, so the the tissues are are getting what they need. So I'm pretty pleased with this. You know, I've, we've given some fluid, our blood pressure is looking good, heart rate is reasonable. Assuming everything else is looking okay, I'm, I'm pretty pleased and may, may wanna to continue to fluid load, uh, you know, if we're, we're still uh, a touch hypotensive. Yeah, I'd agree with that. All right, so let's go ahead and give that second challenge then and see if we can get a, a little more closer to the comfort zone for us. So there's our uh, post bolus information. Yeah, so, you know, I, I would say kind of similar, you know, approach here. Um, you know, we, we, we're loading things, you know, up pretty nicely. We're, you know, our uh, stroke volume variability is, is, you know, kind of coming down. Uh, cardiac output's coming up into a comfortable range for us. Um, you know, stroke volume itself is, is fair and our SVR is back down kind of in our target range. So again, I, I, as the intensivist, you know, I, I'm congratulating my surgeon saying things are looking really nice. We're going to work towards, you know, kind of getting the patient awake and extubated and you know, map is where we want it. Things are, things are looking good. All right. So we end up giving one more bolus and we're sitting on that fence of that SVV of 11 in the gray zone. And, and we find that that, again, that last challenge really wasn't that fruitful. So um, are you guys okay with the resuscitation here after we finally optimize the patient or is there anything additional we need to do? Or is this a good time to grab a cup of coffee and, and see how things settle out? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think at this point, you know, I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm refilling my coffee. I'm, you know, kind of uh, putting my hands on some other patients and, you know, but doubling back. I mean, patients change quickly. Uh, so, you know, I think we're definitely going to circle back quickly. Yeah. Well, you do circle back and, you know, a couple hours later, you do your rounds and, and we see some updated numbers as you're, you're kind of refreshing. So what are your thoughts on some of the changes that have occurred? Uh, the patient settled down, starting to wake up a little bit and, and going into a little further into the recovery. We certainly, they've become uh, much more uh, kind of uh, vasospastic. I could say their SVR has jumped up. Uh, the stroke volume variation has gone way down. So obviously, they, they seem much more adequately tanked. Uh, but their cardiac output has actually dropped now from when we looked at the patient earlier. Yeah, I agree. And, and the thing that jumps off the page here is that is that output dropping. And anytime I see you know, a cardiac output drop, you know, sometimes, I, I mean, I often think about, you know, is, is there, is there fluid? Is there bleeding? What, what's our issue? You know, we're probably going to try some fluid, but that the fact that our stroke volume variation is so low here, um, you know, may not, may, it may not be the right answer. Our stroke volume itself has actually fallen down pretty substantially. So you may try some fluid or we may need to begin thinking about, you know, uh, looking at the heart and thinking about the heart squeeze itself. But I also worry, I think, uh, for us in surgery, and we always want to keep in the back of our mind, is tamponade. Um, you always can, it, and tamponade can present very occultly, and you have to be very cautious not to miss it, uh, and that uh, that needs to be ruled out as well. And there's some ways, I, li I like here, I might bring in a blood gas, see if the patient's acidotic, are they making urine, uh, what's the hematocrit uh, dropped in, have they been bleeding, look at the chest tubes, if all that kind of checks out, then you're kind of right back to the, the pump itself and looking at the heart. All right. And would this be an appropriate time for a passive leg raise if we really didn't want to go down the fluid route? Love it. All right. So we could certainly try that. Ultimately, with this patient, uh, you guys decided to uh, order a dibutamine infusion at a low dose. So this is about 30 minutes post-infusion. So what do you guys think of, of the, the numbers here? I think you got uh, your end results you wanted. Your index uh, or cardiac output certainly came up, uh, came up pretty sharply. Uh, in percentage terms, your stroke volume variation stayed low, uh, and you had a nice reduction in SVR. So I think you're much better placed. The mean pressure is 72. Fully agree. And, and you know, the, for, for patients with low, and we all know this, for patients with low EF, a, a little bit of inotrope, you know, supporting them through the perioperative period is often, you know, essential. And um, you know, maintaining that cardiac output is key. And really reacting to it quickly is also key for all the reasons we've already talked about. Maintaining good organ perfusion really throughout is key. And then just to close it up, I think it's important that really the whole goal that we've talked about throughout this uh, session is that the use of protocols to reduce unnecessary variation with the end result of trying to improve care through that reduction in variability. Very good. And, you know, th this, we've talked about a lot of things, like Sina said, you know, we, our, our CT surgery patients, to me, they're always going to be some of the most interesting patients we see because of the rapidity with which their physiology changes. Uh, it's cool stuff. It's, it excites me. You know, I get excited every time I get to go into the CTICU and care for these folks. But when we're doing it, at, when we are all at our best, we are evidence driven, we are physio physiologic driven, and we can use these advanced kind of continuous physiology uh, monitors to help us understand the patient. Um, and, you know, I think the data is slowly mounting that a perioperative goal-directed therapy is the best care that you can give to your patient. Um, and it, it begins intraoperatively, it carries through the operating theater and continues into the ICU. It's individualized and ultimately it's going to allow us to improve our outcomes. Length of stay, mortality, and then all of those uh, cost, uh, you know, drivers down the road, you know, ileus, renal failure, delirium, all the, all of those things will be better if we do this well.